I'm Gina Luria Walker. I'm professor of women's studies at the New School, and I am the director of the New Historia. The New Historia is a global project of discovery, recovery, and reclamation of the life stories of hundreds of women. We want to make these stories live for people. It's about rewriting history to include the incredible contributions that women have made over time and that have been excluded. The New Historia is such a big project with so many layers, it's a game changer. Being part of the New Historia, being part of Dr. Walker's class helps my self-esteem. It has helped me feel that I matter and that this work is important. I have been collecting women's lives for 40 years, collaborated with scholars from all over the globe, I have developed 400 or so biographies, and this is just the beginning. As a historian, I gather information about women throughout time, incredible figures from the past, whose works are vital to technology, engineering, space exploration. Physicists, mathematicians, computer programmers, artists. So I gather these materials together for the Center for Data Arts, We're coming at this project in a world of new media that is free and open and fluid. It's really exciting to imagine building the interface to this data, and the ways that people will experience these stories. We're trying to create new pathways through this information. So instead of being organized in a timeline, our job is to look through those narratives and kind of tease out the, the common threads. We get to use data visualization to not only find a specific answer to a question that we're looking for, but we're also able to explore it, to turn it around, to twist it, to see new relationships and new connections that we wouldn't have been able to before. We're imagining using virtual reality and augmented reality. Create apps, exercises, and curricula around this. Taking these stories to this digital landscape has the ability to inspire a new generation of young women. This information is something we all need to know. When I share this knowledge at different schools, for girls, it changes their lives. They suddenly sit up a little taller and they become freer in what they imagine for themselves. This is all about possibility. I really want to be a paleontologist. So I think the New School is uniquely positioned to take on a project like this, given its history of work that crosses boundaries of philosophy and social thought and high-level design. The New School is filled with innovative people who can realize what the New Historia needs. The New Historia project is unprecedented in its ambitions, and we need a whole community behind it to make it a reality. We need your support. We've got to have a new perspective on being female. Well, um, I've made myself a pledge that I'm not going to cry, <laughs> but I'm very, very close because to see all of you um, colleagues and students and friends and advisory board members and family and people just interested in the mission of the New Historia is really quite overwhelming. So I will take a breath and begin. <clears throat> I'm Gina Luria Walker. I'm the director of the Center for the New Historia. And I'm fortunate to have spent most of my professional life engaged in the project of feminist historical recovery by collaborating with hundreds of international scholars, researching, learning, and teaching new knowledge about individuals and groups of women. The data generated by the process of recovery now, for the very first time ever, 
in the history of the world makes it possible to construct an alternative history of the past that will incorporate and highlight a female dimension. Women have never been included in the foundations and the creation of foundational knowledge. They just <coughs> haven't. It's not that they weren't doing it, it's that nobody bothered to notice or to record it. <clears throat> and this quest is of the moment, but it is not new. There have always been curious women with an itch to make their mark, but who struggled and suffered and most of the time gave up because they had no female models to look to or to follow. <clears throat> For example, in 1405, Christine de Pizan called for her female contemporaries to roll up their embroidered sleeves and join her in building a literal city of ladies. We have pictures of her with a trowel in her hand. Um, a city of ladies that would shelter, nurture, and celebrate them against the terrible assaults of historical misogyny. In 1803, Mary Hayes published via biography the lives of 302 illustrious and celebrated women in six volumes that sold widely, including in America, and that we believe, and I know, that Jane Austen read as she was creating her fiction. I think it's one of the reasons that Jane Austen creates such unusual, believable, ordinary, extraordinary characters. And in 1946, Mary Ritter Beard, who was actually one of the founders of the New School, although we don't really know that yet, published a book called Woman as a Force in History, in which she pointed out that women's absence from conventional history with a capital H produced mostly by and about men. That's history that we learn with a capital H. That since it left out the female dimension, that it made that history as we were taught it and walked around thinking that we knew it was incomplete and inaccurate. And that's very, very important to remember. Despite these efforts, women continue to be absent from history. How many of you who are students here come to me after class and say, but why didn't I know about these women? Why was I never taught this? In our time, with the help of digital technologies, we are accumulating prodigious data. And many of you in this room have contributed to that and will continue to, I hope. And the prodigious data affirm women's cultural contributions so that as we recover them, they are anonymous no more. Anonymity is not acceptable anymore. But the information remains scattered in scholars' laptops, learned books, and academic conferences. Only on rare occasions does the evidence make its way to public exposure in films like Hidden Figures, which is so revelatory, but one of thousands of stories like that. Or in Deva Sobel's, Deva, can you just put your hand up for a minute? in Davis O'Bell's entrancing new book, and listen to the title, The Glass Universe, How the Ladies of the Harvard Observatory Took the Measure of the Stars. Mm -hmm. Who knew? Certainly not the people at Harvard. <laughs> Certainly not people who were studying the history of astronomy. But Deva, with the help of a former Lang student, who is now the curator of the glass plates at the Harvard Observatory, found them. 
Importantly, those of us engaged in the effort of recovery know that the evidence we are amassing has revolutionary potential to change the experience of being a woman in the world. Yet thus far, that promise has not been realized. And that's really why we're here tonight. Today, unapologetic misogyny poisons the airwaves. I, I have to say that. We have reports that even at elite colleges and universities, girls face unprecedented risks of sexual, of sexual assaults. Hatred produced by sexual distinctions is at an all-time high. So the question and the work of the new Historia takes on real urgency. How do we make use of the new Historia and all the data that we are collecting and get it out into the world and quickly? Debbie Gibb and Regina Law became my comrades in the new Historia about a year ago. Recently, Debbie gave me a postcard that reads, for most of history, Anonymous was a woman. I walked around considering why I found the words so disturbing. Debbie's gift helped me to realize that Anonymous no more, the reverse of anonymity being the name of, of thousands and thousands of women, that this is part of the crucial mission of the new Historia. By unearthing, and this is what the work takes, by unearthing the bodies, tombs, texts, and other evidence of women's actual experiences, the new Historia is committed to building bridges between the women who have gone before us, our own moment and time and place, and the promise to reconfigure the pervasive masculinist mental architecture that renders women anonymous squatters in our own intimate and social lives. I don't know how to say it more strongly than that. We are discovering individuals and groups of women through time and around the globe who, like new continents, constellations, even galaxies, dispel the terrible erasure of the female dimension in history to herald a new, more fully human universe. But how should we deliver the news about this new world most effectively? That's the challenge. To answer this question this evening, we have gathered together a unique form of what I will call women of substance. <laughs> By this I mean women who are themselves vital, and visionary in their passion about the status of girls and women. I look forward to their counsel and to yours. Thank you all so much for being part of this important conversation. Now I'd like to welcome Diana Banks, a member of the new Historia Advisory Board, to introduce our panel. And really bless you for coming. Well done. So thank you, Gina, and welcome, everyone. I'm really excited to be serving as moderator for this discussion. I'm honored to be working with this uh, amazing group of women, and I'm excited about uh, the stories and the information that they're going to share with you. So I'm going to uh, get started and uh, introduce our panel. Amy Emmerich. <laughs> is a chief content officer from Refinery29, the leading digital lifestyle media company for women. She is an award-winning producer and is committed to creating a dialogue with women around topics that matter. Nell Marino, Merlino is creator of Take Our Daughters to Work Day, an icon of the female lead and founder of Count Me In, for women's economic independence. 
Nancy Kendrick, professor of philosophy, Wheaton College, whose research interests include early modern philosophy, metaphysics, and the feminist history of philosophy. Mary Spongberg, Dean, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, University of Technology, Sydney, a professor of modern history. Mary has taught um, Australian history, European history, and women's studies. And then last but not least, Julie Tam, a board strategy consultant, Julie helps organizations tell their stories, working with leadership teams to develop narrative and content. Can we welcome our panel? panel? I was going to start by asking you all to um, take a couple of minutes and introduce yourselves. But I think I'd rather ask you if you would share what you'd like us to know about you. Toughest one. <laughs> Toughest one right out of the gate. <laughs> what you should know about me. I always tell everyone, um, sometimes it's, it's easy to say I'm just a girl from Queens, New York. Um, and that when you are just someone, you have to always remember that you can be something more. So I always try to tell everyone that's the journey I'm on. Awesome. Hmm, I have a longer response. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm a philosopher, we tend to talk a lot. Okay, so I am a professor of philosophy, and that's very important to, to my sense of who I am. Um, I teach at Wheaton College in Norton, Massachusetts. I've been there for 23 years. My uh, area is early modern philosophy, but I teach courses in um, other areas as well. I teach courses in logic, metaphysics, philosophy of mind, and so on. Um, this semester, I'm teaching a course on friendship in the history of philosophy. And this is a topic I've been working on for several years now. Um, in particular, I've been interested in the theories of philosophy two women of my period have. So these women are Mary Estelle in the late 17th, early 18th century, and Mary Wollstonecraft, who's probably more familiar to you than Mary Estelle might be. Um, so Wollstonecraft in the late 18th century. And I'll be happy to talk to you about their theories of friendship at the Q&A or at the um, reception afterwards. But I'll just say now, Wollstonecraft is interested in marriage as a kind of virtue friendship. <laughs> Estelle is interested in female-female friendship. I'm very happy to be here tonight. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to be here. And I think the thing you should know about me is that I'm a catalyst for, for change. And that's what I've done most of my life. And the thing that I value the most is what's going to go on in this room right now. That all of you have come for, for some reason. And I think it's something that we all share. And the challenge that you've put before us as to how we get this information out is something that I, I really want to solve. And I know all of you do. And it's something that's within our power to do. So I'm, I'm excited about what's going to happen in here and what we're going to go forward and do. Um, I'm Mary Sponberg. I'm, I'm a historian. Um, I grew up in the southern suburbs of Sydney, which for anyone of you who know anything about Australian culture, that's puberty blues territory. So <laughs> you're, you're not really expected to become a, a, a professor of history if you grow up in the Sydney southern suburbs. Surfy chick, yeah, <laughs> which I failed dismally at. Um, I've, I'm really pleased to be here tonight. I've been working with Gina for about the last 10 years on different aspects of female biography projects. And I guess the thing that really um, drew me to Gina is her unfailing belief in the radical potential of female biography and if we understand women's lives and if we know more about them, that this has a transformative effect. Um, so it's great to be here, not only because we're launching this, but also because of the, the potential that um, the connection with data is going to, to really change, I think, what, what we've been doing. So that's really exciting. I'm, my current project is a Jane Austen project. Jane Austen is far from anonymous, I have to say. However, my project is about how how men have mediated her life and how we've, because of that, we don't know very much about her maternal family. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about that because everyone's fascinated by Austin, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, just 
to introduce myself, I'm a girl from Texas by way of Vietnam. <laughs> and um, when I heard about this project, I was so incredibly moved by it because in some ways, um, it would have helped me so much as a young girl. Um, I can tell you when I was a girl in Texas, I was like the top science and math student in my high school. And I got into a great college and I ended up studying history and literature. Um, not that you know I regret that, but um, and then I ended up being a journalist for 20 years. And when I left um, People Magazine three years ago, one of the things I wanted to do was to do something different, to be a role model for my own daughter, who at the time was just starting kindergarten, was learning how to read. And as I observed her and her interactions with her classmates, it was shocking to see how even at five or six and seven years old, girls are already beginning to be limited. You know, She's already saying things like, oh, I'm like in the top math group and it's all boys, as if for some reason she doesn't belong. She, why is she the other and the boys are not, right? So anyway, not to be long-winded. Um, one of the projects that I came up with was I wanted to write um, a book for tweens, a novel. That was, going to be a, that was going to be what Nancy Drew was for me when I was a kid. It was gonna inspire girls, and it was gonna be a strong female protagonist, but instead of just talking about her red you know, convertible that she drove around with her friends, this girl was going to solve mysteries using her STEM skills, for being like a really smart coder, you know, real, and, and was not ashamed of it. It was, in fact, what made her cool. Um, so, you know, just kind of going full circle, hearing about finding um, role models for girls and young women to see. And you know, say what you may about pop popular culture, but that's how you affect what, um, girls in, in, in this day and age. And I think that could be a very powerful platform for that. So anyway, when I heard about this, it was very exciting to be a part of it. So thank you for having me. OK, awesome. Um, just so everyone knows, um, if you have a question at some point during the evening, just raise your hand. You'll be handed a postcard. And just jot down your question. And a little later on, we'll read it out and get it answered by the panelists. So the next question that I'm going to ask you all to respond to, you're all very accomplished in your field. Can you talk about a time when you felt anonymous and whether it had an impact on your life's work? And we'll start with you, Julie. Huh. Well, <laughs> it's it's an interesting question to ask a journalist who always has a byline <laughs> because it's it's hard to be it's actually hard to be anonymous when you're a journalist even when sometimes you wish you were because I'll be honest there were stories I was not terribly proud of um, but you know I, I thought it was interesting you know I worked at People Magazine for um, 15 years and it's a magazine for women largely read by women I think that's 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 sort of um, what it's known for. But in that room, um, for many of the years when I was there, most of the editors were men. And I think we already were challenged by the fact that you know, we're a bunch of editors sitting in New York City writing for you know, middle America. But it was a very interesting um, place to be where sometimes you felt like, you know, wait a minute. I'm the reader here. I am a tip, you know. I'm a woman. I am a mom. I I have experiences that inform the way I care about stories, and the men in the room are telling me what to do. And even in a place like that, which you would think, you know, magazines generally, especially women's quote unquote women's magazines, are generally um, have female staffs, but the men they're often men at the top, and that was always a little discomforting. Mary. Um, I think academic women are quite privileged in that we often get, very obviously get to own our work. We write a journal article, we put our name on it, it's our work. And I was very lucky to go to, a, to school for undergrad and, and grad school where there were very feminist academics who I felt, you know, looked after me and, and, and made me who I am today. So I didn't really feel anonymous until my first proper academic job when I moved out of an environment where there were lots of women into an environment where I was one of only three women and the other two women were on leave. And so they started meetings in this department with lady and they'd look at me like, <laughs> and, and gentlemen. And they felt very comfortable with this, but I didn't feel very comfortable with it at all. Um, it was a very old fashioned department and um, it was actually under considerable threat. And the professor was asked to write a strategic plan about how to save the department. 
And because I was the youngest person there by about 20 years and um, I'd been in other departments, he said, have you ever written a strategic plan before? And I said, yeah, I have written a strategic plan. He said, well, can you write a strategic plan for the department? Which I did. And um, anyway, I knew he was going to co-op my work and I didn't mind that so much. But when he, at the faculty meeting, presented the work as his own mm. and then thanked several men in the department for helping him write it, I was just livid. <laughs> like, I just had never felt so anonymous and invisible in my life. How did it change me? How did it, well, I developed a completely different strategic plan that he wasn't aware of. <laughs> I stealthily got young women into the department by becoming very good at writing postdoc applications and grant funding, which has stood me in very good stead. I'm a very good grant writer now. I managed to bring in a whole lot of young, really research active women. Uh, who scared the shit out of everybody. <laughs> I have to say, am I allowed to say that? Um, <laughs> and, um, and then um, slowly but surely I managed to get rid of the head of school and <laughs> the men who really annoyed me and created a very um, you know, interesting department which is now focused on gender and sexuality studies. And also I realised that I was very good strategically for a lot of reasons mm. and um, that stands me in very good stead as being dean as well. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Nell? Uh, I, I've done a lot of work in politics. And I was an advanced woman in, in, in national politics. And this was, um, for New Yorkers, the Al Smith dinner is like the, 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 the quintessential political event toward the end of the election, where both candidates come and the cardinal's there, or the bishop, it's the cardinal, it's the cardinal. And <laughs> it's white tie, and they all you know sit on a dais, and I don't know how they talk to each other, but it's this very formal thing. And I'm the lead advance person for Mike Dukakis when he's running for president. And um, we are having a lot of negotiations with the Catholic Church about how they're going to walk into the dinner and when they're going to do a press thing and whatever. And neither Mike Dukakis or George Bush want to take questions before they walk in because they don't want to talk about choice and abortion because it's a Catholic event. They both have agreed that they don't want to do this. And the Monsignor who's in charge of the press wants this to happen. So I, as the lead advance person for Dukakis, am arguing against it, as is the George Bush lead advance man, who is the president of Amway. He's no, he's no, you know, like he's he's a he's a big CEO. We're both arguing the same thing. And the Monsignor turns to me and says, Young lady, when you can be ordained, I will listen to you. Mm. <laughs> and I went, hmm. <laughs> And to, to my great surprise, and, 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 and I was very grateful, the, the head of Amway you know, took the guy apart, you know, and we didn't do the, the press of ale. But it was a moment uh, where I went on after that campaign to start my own business, mm. and I never looked back, mm. because this, this, uh, this you know, thousand years of the church and whatever, and that you know, you, I'm not, I'm, you're not here. I'm not talking to you because you're not me. It was, whew. So that, that was the last time I was anonymous. <laughs> Nancy. Um, so actually, when I started working at Wheaton in 1994, the college had fairly recently become co-educational. It had been a women's college since its founding. So I had no experiences at all with women's colleges. I went to big state universities. Um, and it wasn't, as I say, it had just become co-ed. In 1988, they started admitting men, so 92, the first co-ed class graduated. I started in 1994. And so when I started there, the faculty talked all the time about gender in the classroom, right? And I had never heard this before. Like in graduate school, this was not something we ever talked about. And so there was a lot of attention, explicit attention being paid to issues around how were things going to change for women at the college now that men were there, right? And so there were, you know, we had workshops and conversation, all of the faculty, the male and the female faculty, right? Everyone was very much conscious, like there's this real consciousness about not wanting women to become anonymous, not wanting women to become invisible or worse, silenced by becoming a co-educational institution, while at the same time wanting to welcome men and have them feel like they belonged there. So it was a very 
talkative time, right? Much, you know, that I had never experienced in my, you know, my training. So this was really eye-opening to me, this emphasis on um, explicit acknowledgement of gender issues in the classroom and of gender issues with faculty and students and with faculty as well. So what I felt there was incredibly empowered, right? What I felt there was like, wow, I, what I realized was how normal my invisibility mm. had felt to me, right, until that sort of moment when it became quite obvious to me. So I can't say I have a kind of moment of anonymity as you've all described. I had sort of the opposite, right? A kind of moment of recognizing a history of anonymity mm. that then was no longer there, right? And so I certainly think my entire career would have been entirely different had I been at a different kind of institution. Mm. Amy? I think I have a similar, um, First of all, I love being called accomplished on this <laughs> level of panel. I'm just saying that. I'll carry that one with me for a few days. Um, but I think that I worked in production for a very long time, and I've always come from a worker bee family. Keep your head down, get your work done. And I would used to think I was very successful. Um, and when I worked at Refinery29, it's about 400 people at the company, about 450. And when I got there, there was about 150, and 100 of them were women. So it's 100 women at a company. And all of a sudden, I walked in, and considering myself successful, and someone said, well, we really want to hear what you think. What do you think, Amy? And I would start to share my ideas and get louder and louder, and someone would start to say to me, we actually think you might be a visionary. Hmm. And I laughed at it. I was like, give me a break. I cannot be a visionary. And I started to look back at what I thought my success was in my career, and I realized, well, I was only succeeding because I was like pretending to be a dude. Hmm. I was working with all men. I was dressing like that, I was like fitting in, and I could talk about things that weren't always comfortable. Um, I remember I even allowed someone to like pet my hair while like they were editing, like just these random things that you allow yourself to fall into. Um, and then until I was put into a power situation with other support from other women who really were hearing me and wanting to know what I believed and then showing me that kind of support about what my voice, voice believed in, um, I think that was the first time I felt seen. I didn't realize how anonymous I had been hmm. the entire time. Interesting. So um, Nancy and Nell, both of you in your talks kind of made reference to men as advocates. You didn't say it exactly like that, but I heard, I heard that. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Um, I'll take that. Uh, I, I have often found that to be the case um, in, in my career where there have been men that have been extremely supportive. I had a great mentor mm -hmm. who, who was a man who, who taught me all about money in, in, in the best way possible. Uh, because I was, I was leaving a paid job. I was over, the Dukakis campaign was over, and I was not going back to working for anybody else. And I was really scared because I'd gotten a paycheck at that point my entire life. And this wonderful man, he said, well, honey, how much do you need to live every month? <laughs> and he did, he talked like that, he still does. He said, honey, how much do you need to live every month? He said, you write all that down, and then you're gonna get a contract, and you, how many contracts do you need to, 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 to make all those bills? And he said, you're going to find out. You're going to get one or two contracts. It's going to cover all that, and the rest is gravy. Well, sure enough, in six months, that's what was happening. Mm. So, so I, would say, I would say to women in general, it's, it's knowing how to pick the right fellas in, in terms of your identification of people who get you and who appreciate what you're about and what you can do. And I would say that's true both in work and in life, mm. that, that you know, I, I have... I have really avoided in a lot of my life situations where I have to work with someone who really would rather I be dead or gone or you know wants to thwart everything I'm doing. I have I had that experience in national politics often and it's one of the reasons I didn't stay in it because mm. it was so about that. But I I think you can you 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 have to you have to pick them and look for them. 
because they're there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are men who recognize our talents and want to join with us because they know they're going to be more successful. And I think right. we just, I think we're better at making sure everybody knows that we were working with them. Uh, as opposed to them stealing the ideas and things like that. I think that that is not something that happens to me these days. Okay. But um, it's it's that kind of thing. I, I think they're, they're, they're wonderful men out there who, who, who see the future and also see what happens and would rather it not happen. So okay. um, one of the things I think that we're, we're learning through study of a lot of female biography is that a lot of the women who, who are quite successful have had very good male support um, and I uh, in my own daily life as a dean um, I'm often asked about you know who, employing women or employing men and there's a very big push in Australia to employ women in the STEM disciplines and I say well you know it's great if we can get women that's fantastic but let's look at the men who actually work with women and see if we can get some of them as well because I think again they are, they're indicating that they're interested in, in diversity and, and getting better results and actually putting the best teams together. So I think, yeah, there are great men out there and that, that often they're very aware of, of having diverse teams and what that might mean. And, um, and I think that's very important for us going forward in, in lots of ways. Absolutely. Okay. So um, next question. If anonymity is the enemy, what's the answer? How do we engage to tell the stories that should be shared. And just jump in there, whomever feels like starting the discussion. I'm looking at Julie. She'll start. <laughs> OK. If anonymity is the enemy, what's the answer? Yeah? Well, I think very specific to the project that I've been working on is creating role models, whether they're real people who did real things in history or fictional ones because, I mean, let's be honest, you know, um, I watched um, Silicon Valley, it came back, and how many women were on that show, <laughs> you know, you know, and when you don't see these role models, how, how do you aspire to it? I mean, it's, you know, it, then, then it's a moonshot. I mean, the same thing happened to me when I was in high school. You know, I, I loved what, I loved studying science and I loved studying math. and. I just, you know, I looked around and once, especially once I got into, got to college, you know, it was so cutthroat. There were no, not only were there no role models, but there were no people willing to take you under your wing to help mm. you out. There simply, it simply wasn't even a possibility for me. I didn't even consider it. And I always wonder what, what might have been because of that. And I, and I don't want that to be the situation for my daughter, for young women today that, you know, just even if, you know, it may have been that I, n I wouldn't have done that. But if, if, if there had been just the possibility that if I hadn't just been shut down even before I considered it, that's so important. And, ha and, and exactly that, showing who these role models are, showing what people have actually done. And even, you know, in a, in a, you might find it a frivolous thing as seeing women programmers on a television show or a girl you know who's using her stem skills in in a detective novel for tweens mm. these are important things to show people okay i'd say awareness mm. i mean that's the answer is awareness what you do you watch that one video and i think that what i try to remind the staff is that there's still a large population that don't know this is a problem or that it happened. So they don't even understand, what do you mean 50-50, this nonsense of equality of pay? Give me a break. Mm -hmm. Like People truly don't see it. So what's the awareness and then how do we tackle that across every platform that we can? So even if it is something, Mel and I were talking about beauty. So even if it's a beauty video, OK, that's fine. I'll make a beauty video, as long as it's not about how you're going to be a better human by using this video. It's about you finding your own self-expression and bringing that out. Now, once we make a short video with that, how do I use that platform and channel that grew because of that? Someone has an interest in beauty. Now, chocolate cover broccoli. Now, find a way to raise the awareness around that. And maybe it's someone from history who somehow touched that beauty product. And make them aware of, are you aware that X female was actually the first person to create this type of product. Because the more we could sprinkle that in and raise the awareness to mass public is when I think you could start to see change. Um, so it's everything from those small moments to the biggest of 
films and highlighting the disparity in what's happening of who, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Mm. And you know, the USC study of 7% of 100 top films are only directed by females. Okay, so let's do a film program where short films are created by 12 women. We allow them to write it. We give them creative freedom for them to use their voice. Okay, that's something. When we did that project, we realized, you know what the footage that's most important here? Actually behind the scenes. Because even though you have that film, and it's so important to get that story out, what was more interesting was watching young girls watch those female directors mm. behind the scenes taking that power. Mm. So how do you really use everything about that project to raise awareness about once what was lost, but what is still not being seen, um, and how to raise that up? So Awesome. Yeah? Yeah, well, I think... Um, I don't regard anonymous as the enemy, but I do regard the, the, uh, the erasure of women's lives. What are the conditions under which women's lives are erased? And getting an understanding of that, I think, is really important. But actually, equally more important, it's, it's the conditions in which we can document and ensure that women are aware of, of, of women's great achievements. And I see this as an incredibly important part of this project, that in fact we are developing the conditions, which are a, a great community of, of, of people bringing this together. And I think this is tremendously powerful because it's not just individuals like me or Gina or Nancy mm -hmm. writing these lives, it's actually a community of, of people creating this. And I think this is gonna be tremendously important. Awesome. Um, yeah, you know, all, uh, what everyone said, I think, is so important, right? This, just this idea of, um, you know, like, sort of swallowing it down, right? Just sort of swallowing down the normalcy of women as computer programmers, right? Or something like that, right? And you have to be sometimes bombarded with this in order for it to be recognized. You know, I feel like, um, you know, as a philosopher, I like to think uh, in terms of what background assumptions we might have when we are... Um, trying to answer questions. And I think that, you know, as we, as we want to make known the lives of women in the past and in the present, you know, it's important that we, 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 we are not comparing women's lives in one period to women's lives in a previous period, right? So that we're not, it's true that 20th, first century women's lives are better than women's lives in the 17th, 18th, or 19th century. But that's not the issue, right? I think we all can recognize that, that, that women are more visible in some ways compared to women in the past. The issue is um, how women fare relative to men in their particular times and cultures, right? And so I think that we need to tell the stories of women's of women intellectuals, of women creative yeah. artists, and so on, in a way that um, emphasizes the way uh, historical periods may try to seek to make women anonymous, right? So not comparing women to other women who had it worse than they have, mm -hmm. right? But how do women fare in every period relative to the men of that period, mm -hmm. right? That's the way I think we have to think about it. I would say most importantly, what I notice across the country and around the world when I speak, and women ask me questions, they never tell me their name. <laughs> so I would say it's up to all of us to say our name, and to say our name in as many ways as we can think of. I look at Instagram and Twitter and all kinds of things too often. But what I don't see enough of is women claiming credit themselves for what they do. That we have an opportunity now, we talk about the data and the technology now, we have an opportunity now, today, right now, to identify ourselves and claim our space. Mm -hmm. And we often don't. The majority of what girls look at on social media is fashion and celebrity. And I think it's up to us to show them that there's another way to describe ourselves. That is, because one of my, it's, it's a short story. I can see my part, yes, but, but it's a short story. Uh, <laughs> I was at a conference years ago, and there was an extraordinary woman from the Indian micro lending organization called Sewa. And she was describing the thing they do for the first week of a program that women go to. It was early micro lending stuff. What they spend the first three days learning is how to say their name 
because they'd never known their name because they were somebody's daughter, wife, husband, mother, whatever. They didn't know their name and they had never said it. Hmm. And I would argue that sometimes we are not very far from that. And we need, because the reason these men are known is because we know their names. The most significant thing in Hidden Figures is the woman who keeps putting her name on the report. Mm -hmm. That's how we knew the whole story, because we could find her and her reports. So your names. <laughs> so I'm going to read a couple of questions from the audience. With social media, young women are constantly documenting, but often that's not reality. How is technology making things easier and harder for the recovery effort of the future? Who wants to talk about that? I mean, I could talk about it all day long. <laughs> but what's so funny, what I'm realizing is, look, Snapchat Discover is a channel I have to program every day. And that's very young, Gen Z. Um, I actually think that the interaction we get back, at least for a certain percentage, is their reality. It is the map of their reality. Mm. And that is something very important to take in. And Instagram, you might see, has become so superficial. But the reality of Instagram stories is that it allows you to get behind the scenes. So I do think that the trend is slightly changing to something that was perceived to be perfection and inspiration in their minds, but now flipping to a little bit about, like, but what's the reality behind it? And I, so I do think that there is a trend there because you are sharing more. You're not just sharing one aspect of it. Um, I do see a lot more connection and engagement when it's uh, behind the scenes of their life and sharing much more difficult topics of conversation. So they may be clicking on that celebrity. Um, and that is just something a society is going to be very hard to move away from. Um, but I think that, again, that chocolate covered broccoli is when they're clicking on that, what else are you giving to them and what else are they sharing? Because trust me, it gets much deeper. They're much more socially conscious and aware of, okay, you think that it's all Kim Kardashian, but they're actually not talking about infertility mm. in a way that was never spoken about before that used to be very taboo. So I always say that we have a responsibility to make sure that we you know, tap that conversation as much as we might be giving them the Kim Kardashian. Um, so I don't, I try to look at the positive side what, of it. One of the things Otherwise, I'm so I wouldn't curious about in this, though, is are girls focused on celebrity and fashion in social media because it's where the most images of women are? Mm. Because I think, you know, if you look at the research on boys, boys look at a whole range of things because there are men and boys in Correct. a whole range of things. Mm. Yes. And, and, and so I, I, I used to, I, it used to make me cringe, and I now increasingly think that around this project, the somehow um, flooding of things with these images and stories mm -hmm. where they can see something that they've not seen before that's a cool story and didn't know that there was a crown princess of Hawaii and the whatever was on Instagram the other day. But something about them being able to see more female images who solved problems at different times, did something, really appeals to me because I think they're looking because they're women. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't Absolutely. think they're just looking because they care about what they look like. They're looking for them, they're looking for a mirror, they're looking for themselves. Yes. I think we had a stat when I started, it was 65% of our audience felt they didn't, cannot see themselves anywhere. Yeah. I mean, that was from the bus stop to the movie theater. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, that was like one of the highest stats that kind of just drove it. Yeah, so you know, in my discipline, it's, um, it's um, much more, many more men than women in the discipline of philosophy. And so, you know, it's often the case that students take courses in the history of philosophy without having ever studied any women at all. Right, so they enter the class thinking there are no women in the history of philosophy, and they leave the class thinking there are no women in the history of philosophy. I mean, I'm sorry to say, this happens a lot. So actually, you know, the question about what, what does tech, how can technology, how does it help us, and what challenges does it present? You know, one of the ways it helps us is, you know, just having access to, you know, thousands of texts written by women, say, in the 18th century. It does allow women to see themselves as theorizers, right, as writers, as thinkers, and so on. But it also shows something about what 
scholarship is or what or how, let's see how I'm gonna put this, like, you know, there's hundreds of years of scholarship on Locke's essay, hundreds of years of scholarship. So, you know, like every tiny little detail has been worked over in some way. There's very clear um, categories for thinking about Locke's work. You read someone whose work doesn't exist in a modern mm. edition, and it's a, like, on the one hand, it's just a, it's just a completely open field that's exciting and terrifying, right? There's no structure for you to sort out your ideas in. You have to create the structure, right? That's very exciting, but it's also very scary. So I have a follow-on question for you, Nancy. Okay. I'm a first-year philosophy student, Yay. and had it not been for Gina's class, I would have not read any women philosophers as independent, I would have not read any women philosophers as independent thinkers, rather than as derivatives or worse, footnotes, mm -hmm. to or of famous male philosophers. My question then is, why in your opinion do philosophy departments and the philosophical canon by extension, why don't they pay enough attention or give enough credence to these phenomenal women and their contributions? To <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, I'll say my own department is not in that way, right? I mean, it's a small department. You know, it's a small department. As we say, it was a women's college before, so there's a lot of attention, you know, paid to this kind of thing. You know, I think sometimes I just think it's we just do the same thing we did before. Like we teach classes the way we learned them in graduate school, and then you know after a while, like you're just repeating the same thing. I mean, I, I I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I do say it because it's true. It was only maybe ten years ago I looked at my metaphysics syllabus and I said to myself, there are no women on the syllabus. Why not? Right? And there are women who do metaphysics, but I just didn't look for them. Mm. Right? Or I wasn't you know sort of conscious of this. So I think it's that, like there has to be a willingness to, to think, I have to do it differently from the way I did it. And th what people often say is like, oh, if you study women who are not well known, you'll never get into graduate school because this is the way the discipline works. Yes, but the discipline has to change, it has to grow, it has to develop. I will say, the last time I went to the APA, which was just this year, the American Philosophical Association meeting in Baltimore, I was just in heaven, right, to see all of these young, people, you know, talking about important things. It, it just was really astounding. So I do think there's hope. I mean, I do think it is changing. Thank you. Awesome. Next question. There are some supportive men. What about non-supportive women? Why are we the worst <laughs> offenders? <laughs> yeah, I'll go there. <laughs> um, I'm not going to name any names, <laughs> but um, I remember when I was starting out in journalism, I uh, worked at Time Magazine. There was a group of us who were starting around the same time. We were all young, just out of college. It was probably half male, half female. Um, within probably about four years, all the women had left. All the men were still there. And it was interesting. It, what, and I, I had male mentors when I was there, but what, what was interesting that, was that there was a particular female editor who had her pack of boys that she liked to bring along. She never mentored any women. She only mentored boys. And that was just so staggeringly upsetting to all of us women that even, you know, and, and, and I, this is gonna, I, I don't wanna sound condescending, but I do feel like her generation was raised to feel like it's a zero-sum game. It's me and nobody else. I'm the, I'm the one woman who's gonna make it to the top. And, yeah. Um, I, I have experienced great uh, female mentorship, but I have also experienced, um, I think, you know, second wave feminists who, you know, say to you, you've got it so easy, you know, you've, you've, you've had maternity leave, you had all this, you know. And I've started to, uh, to talk to them and to, to, to my, my students to say, look, 
it's hard, it was, it's hard, but it's different hard. And I think um, this idea of different hard is, you know, I hope it takes on because I think <laughs> the conditions of our, you know, lives have changed really dramatically. Um, and yeah, we do get maternity leave, but there's a whole range of other things um, that, that are about, you know, we'll use that 18th century t term, the sexual distinction still that impact on women's lives. And I try and get that dialogue happening about different hard. I would, my experience with this has had to do with success. Hmm. Um, and I think it speaks more to people's difficulty with success, but I particularly think women's difficulty with success. That it's, um, it's somehow, that it's only to, to, to the, you know, that it's only going to happen to one person or something. That there's there's you know you only get one chance to go steady or you know whatever that whatever that thing is. But but that if it's happening to you, it's not going to happen to anyone else. As opposed to understanding fundamentally that if it's happening to me, the likelihood of it happening to you mm -hmm. is much greater. Mm -hmm. And that's what's always confounded me in 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 those dances that go on where you know somebody really tries to mess you up because you know whatever. But. Um, it's just, it's unfortunate. And, and I, I think, you know, when we can talk about it, we, we need to. Because I don't know that a lot of women understand that that's what they're doing. I mean, I, I may be being generous here, but I actually think they don't. I think they're protecting themselves somehow. Have you ever confronted it and had the situation change? Yeah. Well, you know, it's like, let's make a deal. You know, what do you want? What do you want? What, what, what are you so interested in, in taking away from me? Mm. What do you want? I think that is, that is often the question when confronted with that kind of stuff is, what do you want? Mm. You want me to, to, to not be as good as I am at this or as whatever? <laughs> well, that's not, that's not changing. Do you, want to, do you want to be as good as me at this? I could help you figure that out or whatever that is. I think it is that kind of conversation because mm. it's really what it is. Mm. They're pissed. It's not happening to them. Mm. So how's it going to happen for you? But I have had experiences, and then I will stop with a woman who was constantly after me. I created something called Make Money Million Dollar Business, and she somehow thought that threatened an organization that she had that, that had women in it who were already at a million. So I was like a feeder program for her. I was like a gift to her. <laughs> and she was furious because I always got more press than she did. I finally included it in a New York Times story, and all she did was talk trash about me in the story. Mm. So I'm not helping her anymore. <laughs> but you know, some people can't get over it. But I think I did. I, I included her in this incredible story, and she still was at it. So that yeah. was it. Can't help everybody. <laughs> yeah. OK, um, next question. How do we address diversity in experiences of womanhood in our work? Racial, economic status, non-Western sexuality, trans question. Any thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking about this a lot. Uh, as a creator of Take Our Daughters to Work Day, it's, we're about 25 years into that. And I think we talk a lot about what girls and women are going to do for work and what your life is going to be about. And we haven't talked enough about what our whole life is about. You know, how to choose the right partner, fella, gal, whoever it is, and you know, how to construct a life and how to put all this new stuff that we can do in it. Mm -hmm. And I think it is in that, I've been, I'm, I'm working on sort of the creation of a new sort of 21st century sort of coming of age ritual almost, where, where we, we get to talk and understand what that is. And I think in that, we would start to understand and, and talk about all the different places that we come from, because we would have to, for that to be meaningful. You would have to take into consideration all different walks of life, because they're all in this room. But, but that is, I, I, I think it's something that's missing in a lot of things. And, and it needs to be, and we need to bring it forward. Women need to bring it forward. It is something that we need, it's something that the world needs. Rather than us fitting into the world that men made, we need to make our own way in this and start to define how we want to live with them. Not, not, not without them, with them. But we need to do some of the defining ourselves rather than living in reaction to them. 
And I say that is true for girls across all ethnic backgrounds, economic backgrounds. We have to step up and say, this is how we want it to go. Yeah, anyone else? I was just going to say, because I know the question was, how do we? And mm -hmm. I just felt like, how do we not? Mm -hmm. So here, here. I think a large part of it is vulnerability, too. I mean, I think, again, in our company, we I try to fight all the time. We might have diversity on the page, but do we are we really highlighting culture? And, and is that happening? Um, obviously, politics. Um, you say you're an inclusive company, but how do you do that when you're also a liberal company? Um, and how do you at least feel like you're creating safe space for people to have really conflict conversation? Mm. Um, so you have to show some vulnerability and admit, I might be messing this up. Yeah. So when that's happening, the responsibility of the staff to, to say that, to speak up, to highlight when they notice it, um, and to also never assume there are many We've had many incidents where someone might be an immigrant, but they don't look like an immigrant. Or someone might be a person of color, they may not assume the way you believe a person of color looks. Mm. And, and that dialogue really helps us to like push ourselves and elevate up, and then just directly ask. The idea that it's just too hard to hire um, is ridiculous, and you just have to be a little vulnerable and call a friend, call another friend. Mm like hunt someone down on LinkedIn and say, you look like you went to X college. Can you connect me with someone? Mm -hmm. And it's definitely work, but um, I think it pays off. And right now, especially in this time and day and age, we just, you, don't, you can't not, so. Mary, did you want to add in or no? Okay. All right, um, next question. How do you recommend young women girls find their own identities from the sometimes toxic nature of group mentalities. Yeah, it is tough. Donna, help me do the 21st century new ritual. We need it. We need it. This is, this, this, this is the kind of question that keeps coming up that we have to create an answer for. Because there really isn't an answer. We've had this gift of this new way of knowing all the things that we know, all the things we can do with the reason that we're here tonight, all the things that data and technology can do to spread this story. It has also spread a lot of really awful stuff. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have to take the good stuff, I think toughen girls up for some of the bad stuff. They gotta get tougher, they do, they do. When they see some of this stuff and hear it and, and have to choose between themselves and the group, because that's what the, I, I understand the choice is. How, how do I, I literally had a question two weeks ago in London from, a, from a, 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 an 11 year old. How, how can I be what you, you ladies are talking about and still stay in my group online? How can I be acceptable to them and be myself? We did not have to answer that question. But and I think together, go ahead. No, so I just, I'd ask, I'm sure you can all think back to being that 11-year-old girl, and we, we might not have had, we didn't have the internet to um, create all of the drama, right? But girls know how to create drama without the internet. Um, and so I remember, I remember back in my day, we had um, something called a, a slam book, right? It was a notebook, and there was someone's name at the top of every page, and you pass it around, and people wrote what they wanted to say, which to me is kind of sort of like the internet now, right? It was just you know static form. You carried it around instead of reading it online. So how did you all deal with either stepping back or pushing back from that energy back then? Because I, I think it's kind of sort of, it will take the same type of tactics nowadays just ramped up a little bit. I'm not sure I did a great job, to be yeah, honest. Yeah. You know, you know, I was clearly different. You know, I was an immigrant. You know, um, growing up in Texas, there weren't a lot of kids like me. I was smart. You know, that's another X against you. Um, and it's hard. I think, and and I've had this conversation with my husband, who had a much more, I guess, normal upbringing in the suburbs of New York that um, I you know I I think I found my foot you know I had friends 
groups of friends in, in middle school and high school. And I think I, I really found myself in college where you are in, in, in I think for, for a lot of kids, high school is just horrible. Middle school is the worst, high school is horrible, and you go off to college and you can start fresh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you will find people who have your same interests. You will find people who may be a little bit more like you. And more importantly, you will find people who are a lot different from you. And seeing that makes you find levels of commonality that aren't the obvious, that aren't we have the same color hair, the same color eyes, look the same, wear the same clothes. You know, it may be a, an interest that you never really expressed before. And I think you find, you find your place at some, you know, and some people have a much harder time than others. And then, you know, and I, and I see it in my daughter. My daughter is eight, and it starts so young, you know? Mm -hmm. The group mentality, the, just all of that. It starts so young. And, you know, I think she's, she obviously ha is going to have a much different childhood than, than I did, but I, I kind of feel like there, it, the technology may be different, but it, it's, it's, it's inevitable, and it's sad. And I'm really trying. I'm, you know, if you have any ideas for how I can get my eight-year-old daughter through, you know, through um, the next eight, years. the next yeah. twenty years, for that matter, um, let me know. Um, but it, it's, you know, I encourage her to be herself. When she, when all her friends want to do one thing and she wants to do something else, I'm happy about it. Hmm. Um, I think I. I grew up in the southern suburbs where it was, you know, you had to be a surfy chick to be liked and I wasn't that. And I think I think the thing that really saved me was that I had two grandmothers who weren't people pleasers and mm. I saw that it was okay not to be a people pleaser. And I think I've modelled that with my daughter who Gina knows who is definitely not a people pleaser. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it comes back on me quite a lot but it, give, it has given her a toughness and, and so when that, you know, dealing with group stuff happens, she's just says that the group's wrong, like she's right and she's not going to be a people pleaser. And it's tough. She's, you know, often at home on a Saturday night on the couch mm -hmm. with me watching, you know, something on television when her friends are out drinking or whatever. But um, I think that toughness is going to stand her in really mm -hmm. good stead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It all comes back to... A, a, just a quick, a, yeah. just a very quick response to that. I, I don't think I handled it very well when I was 11. And I also just feel like it's not like it's a one-time thing, right? Like it, it just takes a long, long, long time to figure out how to negotiate that. So, you know, I see this with my students too now who are not 11 year olds, right? They're young women and men, you know, they're in their 20s. And, you know, they're still, they, they, they're still figuring this out too. We're all still figuring it out, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I don't know that there's ever a time when you can say, okay, now it's, now it's done, right? I've got that sorted out. So, I don't know, maybe I'd want to say to 11, to your eight-year-olds, like, or to say to you, like, I know you want to help her in this way, but she'll have lots and lots and lots of time yes. to revisit and renegotiate her own sense of herself. I, I, the, the one thing I would say is I don't think girls get acknowledged enough for the absolute amazing things that they accomplish. And I think in the course of, you know, sort of the next wave of whatever we're going to do, the more girls can be acknowledged for all the different things that they do. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, starting a business at 11 or all the different things that I see girls doing, but that, that it be properly acknowledged, certainly by their families, but also by other people, by their teachers, by their group leaders or whatever. I think there's not enough of that. I think we talk almost way too much about the problems that girls have, mm -hmm. as opposed to the wonderful things that they do and the, and the just brilliant, capable people that they are. I think we would go a long way to, to helping them get over this when they see some reward or acknowledgement for what they're capable of. But spreading kindness. I mean, I think you were saying you're on Instagram now or now, like whatever you're, whatever you're stalking. Um, I think that mentorship comes at any level in any yes. moment. And there's such a way that just don't do a heart, like literally just send a note um, or one statement and it changes everything for them. And even if you're in college or master class, you're doing that to a high school student can change it. And I don't think it happens enough. I don't think they realize the abundance that social can actually have and no one seeks out to highlight that. But I think those things really change it 
and direct them. And again, about seeing it for your eight-year-old, hunting those kids down who are also that age and highlighting that, even if they're not in the area, I find can be game-changing. Um, and we see that even at the level of trying to find new social stars from within staff and like one-on-one -on -one messaging and just saying, this was amazing when you did this and the way that you put that out in the world and that was smart and wh what else do you have? What else do you wanna do? Um, it matters more actually as you get older and I don't know, and have clout and they wanna hear it. I got so. on Instagram because I have a niece who at the time was 12 who didn't talk very much but I noticed if I followed her on Instagram and I started putting things on it, we de have developed a relationship mm. doing that. So I, I would second that emotion. Okay, so we're gonna enter a speed round. I'm gonna okay. read questions and um, one person will answer each so we can get through them because they're really good questions. Gina is a revolutionary. How do we honor her by thinking in a revolutionary way? Right now we're hearing some of the same tactics we've heard a while ago. Oh. Mm. <laughs> do any of you have an answer? <laughs> okay, I'm going to move on to the next one. Think about that, panelists. I'm going to come back to it. Can you comment on the tactics used by the fearless girl? I tell you, me, that one, I would put one of those everywhere I could think of. I think it has generated a lot of very interesting conversation, continues to. There's a lot of you know, stuff around it, but it is, again, it goes to the heart of girls seeing themselves. Mm -hmm. And the value of Take Our Daughters to Work Day is that millions of girls saw themselves in the front pages of papers. Here, girls literally see themselves walking down the street in one of the most hostile places to girls and women in the world. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm all for it. Okay, girl versus woman. How do we stop people, ourselves included, from calling adult females girls? We are women. <laughs> I'll say actually in connection with the previous question, it's interesting to me that the fearless girl is not a fearless woman. Mm. Mm. Right? I mean, she is a girl, like literally, she is. I mean, yeah, this is a statue she's of a, a girl. girl. Right, and I, I think that says something, right, that it is a girl and not a woman. Hmm. Or, or redefine it. We actually have a show, we have an announced that called Girly, but the director, she's an Academy Award winning director, came up with the idea because she was tired of it being something that didn't mean something good. So she said, well, let's redefine this and show all these young women who would consider themselves girly, but they own it and they're changing the world. So I think that goes back to all of us and the responsibility that we have to take something like that and start to redefine it yourself. Okay. I, I don't have a problem with being called a girl. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Because it is, it is, it is about our gender. And I, again, I think we're letting someone else define yeah. that somehow that is less than that there is something exactly. de minimis in it, hmm. as opposed to it being an identification of our gender, yeah. which we are women, we are girls, we are, we are a lot of things. So um, I'm okay with it. Okay. From an online viewer, how can we better reward Wall Street for increasing women on corporate boards? Show. Show. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh. Why do they need positive reinforcement? Yeah. I, I would say hire like as many more as you've already done and we'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> like double the number. I, I, wow. How do we get them to do it? Mike. Is that the question? Yeah. Mike, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, I'd say. Should we? How do we reward them positively? Uh, thank you. <laughs> no, seriously, thank you for doing it. Thank you for doing it, and you need to do more. You have to do more mm. for it to really work. If they're not three of us, it's, it ain't working, because yep. we're too isolated and it's too hard. So I would say, I don't know of many Wall Street firms, I'm sure there, there might be one or two that have more than two, uh, where you start to have a critical mass of, of thought and things like that. So I would say thank you for what you've done and keep going. All right. It's in your own best interest. True, true. 
Can one of the academics speak to the use of the archive in creating new historia and how opening the archive can help women both in the academic and outside, I'm sorry, both in the academy and outside the academy gain more visibility or are we just talking to ourselves? Um, I'll speak to that. Okay. I, I actually think this speaks to the, you know, honouring Gina as a revolutionary as well. I mean, archives traditionally used to be very elite institutions. They, they preserved, you know, materials that, that certain elites wanted to maintain and, and record, keep. And I think the, the thing about this project is that it, it opens the archive and it creates new archives and it allows us to, to uh, have um, great access to the archive, but it also allows us to pull together a whole lot of information that previously, you know, individual historians um, working in, in archives could have access to and often take years and years to accumulate. This is an incredibly democratic, you know, the potential of being incredibly democratic. It has the potential to to allow us to look, you know, you know, look for individual words or you know, like things that great networks. I think it's 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 it's, it's extraordinary, and I think this accessibility is going to be very, really really important. Um, and I think that's the revolutionary potential of this program. And this is how we're going to honour Gina with with the revol with that revolutionary opening of the archives, changing what an archive might be, allowing accessibility. Um, and creating new archives. So we have time for one last question, and I'm going to ask each of you to leave our guests with a piece of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this is wisdom, but it, it gets back to the, the Wall Street question. Um, um, you know, I think we're facing an incredibly complex century with big, wicked problems that we, we need to think about that will need us to be collaborative, global, cooperative, and accepting of diversity because we need the best minds to be working on these problems. And, and that means the best minds, not just of, of, of elite groups, not just of, of men, but across the whole spectrum. And I think it's really important this project in terms of showing that, that when women engage in things, they can do anything, but also that, that that opens it up to a whole range of other people. And I think that's really, really important. And I think that until we embrace diversity for what it brings to, to every project, um, that's, that's, we're not going to be able to tackle these project, projects and we're not going to be able to work co collaboratively or bring all that stuff together. And I think that's tremendously important. Um. I'm, I'm a part of a, of, a, of a new project called The Female Lead. And this is the book and their videos and there's a whole campaign that I'm, I'm developing with them. And it really does strike me that we, we need to challenge ourselves in terms of knowing our own history. And, you know, when whoever said that, you know, we keep coming up with the same old thing. Um, there's a part of me that thinks, what if, what if there were opportunities for scholarships and all kinds of things and some kind of a, almost a game show where you had to memorize and know these stories to be able to identify who these people were? There has to be something that really gets girls to go look at this and read it and understand it and connect it to their future. Because that, that's why I'm doing this work now because uh, it's connecting girls to, to, to a very different range of, 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 of women than, that I've seen ever in a book like this. And I think there are, if, if they are so hungry to know this, why don't we give them a reason to know it that is going to move them forward is really sort of how I think it. Because I think with the, the, the more academic, you know, opening up the archives to those folks, but how do we open this up to girls? Because girls keep saying things like girls... Girls are like the keenest observational scientists. They, yeah. they, they check out everything and they don't see themselves. This issue of not seeing yourself. Yeah, yeah. What if we presented them with the, these 400 just to begin with yeah. and, and, and say, look at this. How do, we get, how do we get that happening? I think something like that where they could look at it and then sort of show their knowledge about it, I think somehow would shore them up to know that they are not the only ones and, and also then increase people's knowledge about it is, is 
where as far as I've gotten so far. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because there's such great stories and the pictures are so beautiful because they, they want to see themselves. They want to see what, what we did. And, and it isn't just that they look like us now, but they look like them. All that success with like the American Girl doll that has that sort of historical context, you know, some of them. What if you saw all these living characters from history um, and what they accomplished and what they, what they overcame and all that kind of stuff. I think that they might find it fascinating. I think even just this room being able to pledge to yourself and maybe that's how we honor the revolutionary project um, of what you can do to help spread that historia, right? Mm. I mean, I think that's what it is because it doesn't have to be as revolutionary as what we're sitting in and is about to happen, it can be as simple as I'm going to pick one female that I learn about within that project and I'm gonna spread their message as far and as wide as I can because it will inspire others to say, I wanna learn about this and then it, it will spread on its own because the eagerness is already out there. So the wisdom I always try to say is, you know, I was very, you mentioned one of your students said, why didn't I learn about these? And I always got very angry. I'm like pissed off. That I never got to learn about any of this and at 42 is when I'm like discovering life um, but I try to take that energy and I'm not judging I'm just trying to support so if all of us felt some type some type of responsibility to do that I think it would grow organically on its own I think um, to I think some people touched upon this as well, and, and just to add to that is this idea of community. We can't all work in silos, mm -hmm. and that applies to life. But I think in particular this, it's so important to make it a community right. effort that we all work together. I, I will just add that um, it's so important for us to be really <coughs> careful and thoughtful about how we describe what women do. Like, what are the adjectives we use? We have to really think about what we're saying. Like, how often do we talk about being courageous, mm -hmm. right? If we're not describing behavior like that, why not, right? Why don't we describe women in those terms? And I, so I, I think it is a matter of our, it's not only a matter of this, but mm -hmm. certainly, um, you know, to and also to like listen to how things are described on the radio or on TV, right? And and try to counteract that where we can. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time, your wisdom, and your truth. It's been a good conversation. Yeah.